Sonnet 43, or How Do I Love Thee, by Elizabeth Barrett Browning, was published in 1850 as part of a collection of 44 sonnets entitled Sonnets from the Portuguese. They had in fact been written some five years earlier, before Barrett Browning's marriage to her husband, the fellow poet Robert Browning. Never intended for publication, they are passionate love sonnets tracing the progression of Barrett Browning's love affair with her husband-to-be, from the doubts she felt at their meeting, to the passion that she felt for him prior to their elopement. Upon reading them, however, Browning declared that they were on a par with Shakespeare's sonnets and should, therefore, be published. In order to spare her blushes, the title of the collection was to falsely allude to the idea that they had been translated from another language. The working title, Sonnets Translated from the Bosnian, was changed on a suggestion by her husband to Sonnets from the Portuguese. Browning's nickname for his wife, due to her dark hair colour, was My Little Portuguese, and constituted therefore a private and intimate pun. In the poem, Barrett Browning attempts to enumerate the ways in which she loves her husband-to-be. What emerges is the picture of an all-encompassing love which transcends space, time and death and which, ironically, defies the measurement that she sets out to take. The poem follows the structure of a Petrarchan sonnet. It has 14 lines divided into an octave, eight lines, made up of two quatrains and a sestet, six lines with a base metre of iambic pentameter. Didum, 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 didum. And a rhyme scheme of A, B, B, A, A, B, B, A, C, D, C, D, C, D. Although Barrett Browning does play around with both of these. The beginning of the sestet is marked by a volta, or turn, which usually signals a change in direction, such as presenting a solution to a problem or a commentary on a situation which has been explored in the octave. In this sonnet, Barrett Browning uses the octave to explore her love for her husband-to-be in terms of the present. In the sestet, she turns her attention to both the past and the future. The phrase I love thee, repeated nine times, is used to start clauses no fewer than eight times throughout the sonnet. This anaphora adds to the sense of assertiveness in Barrett Browning's tone. She is a woman who knows her own mind. The is an archaic form of the word you, which had already fallen out of common parlance long before the Victorian period. Used in the same way as the French tu to indicate a singular and informal you, It communicates intimacy and tenderness. Sonnets were also out of fashion at the time that Barrett Browning was writing, having enjoyed their heyday during the Elizabethan period. They had seen a revival during the Romantic period at the end of the 18th century and into the beginning of the 19th, but by the time Elizabeth Barrett Browning was writing, very few sonnets of any note were produced. It should also be considered that the poet's preference for thee over you might be a means of harking back to an earlier golden age. There's a noticeable semantic field of religion in the sonnet, as well as reference to verses from the Bible, suggesting the deep spirituality of her love for him. The poem begins with a rhetorical question. How do I love thee? There is no question that she loves him. What she is doing here is challenging herself to articulate or to put into words not only the extent of her love for him, but also the qualities of this love. The use of a metrical inversion in the very first foot, how do I love thee, where the expected I am is substituted for a trochee, emphasises this. The caesura in the exact middle of this line allows the reader to pause for just a fraction of a second 
and symbolises Barrett Browning's own pause as she ponders this question. Her next very brief sentence, Let me count the ways, reveals her love through her claim that the ways in which she loves him can be enumerated to be multifaceted. Her description of the first way in which she loves him, using a spatial metaphor, is developed over the next three lines up to the end of the first quatrain and needs unpacking with a bit of help from the Bible to understand it fully. I love thee to the depth and breadth and height my soul can reach when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace. Note that the triplet or tricolon, depth and breadth and height, relates to dimensions and are connected using polysyndeton, where multiple coordinating conjunctions such as and, but and or are used to emphasise that her love is three-dimensional and all-encompassing. This volume that her love for him takes up is not, however, physical space. She transcends or goes beyond the physical realm and into the spiritual as it is the extent to which her soul can reach that is the measure of her love. In other words, her love for him fills her soul, and as this is an abstract concept, its bounds are therefore limitless. The phrase, when feeling out of sight for the ends of being and ideal grace, is ambiguous, as ends can mean both boundaries as would be suggested by the reference to dimensions, and purpose or end goal. Her words echo a passage in the Bible from Ephesians 3, verses 17 to 19, and if we look at this, her meaning becomes a little clearer. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. This echoing underlines the almost religious nature of her love for Browning and her blind faith in him, enhanced by her capitalisation of key words as she likens it to her soul's quest for the spiritual meaning of life. The purpose of existence, or the ends of being, and being filled with the fullness of God, or ideal grace, which is attained through a faith which surpasses knowledge by going beyond visible evidence, when feeling out of sight. The use of enjambment here, which does not allow the reader to pause at the end of each line, enhances the infinite and overwhelming nature of her love. Not only is her love for him spiritual and incomprehensibly vast in nature, it is also of the earthly realm and concerned with the mundane minutiae, or small details, of daily life, all day, every day. I love thee to the level of every day's most quiet need, by sun and candlelight. The juxtaposition of this image of familiarity and cosy domesticity with the previous mind-bogglingly metaphysical image adds yet another dimension to the qualities of her love for him. The next two lines are end-stopped. I love thee freely as men strive for right. I love thee purely as they turn from praise. To allow the momentum to build as the anaphoric phrase I love thee comes in quick succession. The two sentences also have a parallel structure of I love thee plus adverb plus simile, which enhances the rhythmic nature of these lines. In the first simile, she reveals that her love is given to him naturally and without coercion, in the same way that humankind uses the free will given it by God to strive to act morally. In the second simile, she claims that her love for him is humble, selfless and unconditional, in the same way that, 
rather than court praise, humankind modestly turns away from it. The next line also begins with I love thee, thus completing a triplet of I love thee's in quick succession. The momentum which has been built in the previous two short lines reaches a climax here, as the image, through the use of enjambment, spills over onto the next line. This triplet straddles the octave and the sestet, the build-up of emotion thus hitting the reader on line nine at the beginning of the sestet, and so at the volta, where she switches her attention to her painful past. I love thee with the passion put to use in my old griefs and with my childhood's faith. Her love for him is almost alchemical in its power, as it has enabled her to turn negative emotions from her earlier life into positive ones. Barrett Browning's life up to this point had been plagued by illness and tragedy. Chronic extreme pain in her head and spine starting at age 14 which left doctors baffled, led to a loss of mobility and dependency on pain-killing opiates. Some years later, at the age of 21, she also went on to develop symptoms of tuberculosis. Two of her brothers died young, one of a fever in Jamaica, the other in a boating accident in Torquay. The passion or deep emotion that she spent on her old griefs or on the pain and tragedy from her past, is being put to better use as she channels it into her love for him. She also refers to her childhood's faith, suggesting that she trusts him implicitly with the innocent, unquestioning faith of a child and that his love has effectively washed away the painful experiences of the past, which perhaps lead to bitterness and cynicism. In the next line and a half, she continues to explore her past. I love thee with a love I seemed to lose with my lost saints. Although the language here comes from a semantic field of religion, Barrett Browning is more than likely referring to the people in her past that she once held in high esteem, but who have now fallen off their pedestals, rather than the saints that are revered by the Christian faith. We know that the couple were forced to elope because her father disapproved of the match. She remained estranged from her family and her father disinherited her. Note the way in which Barrett Browning chooses words with sounds that are harder to articulate in these lines where she is referencing her pain in the past. In line 11, the word griefs ends with a fs sound, which is inverted later in the line with the words childhood's faith which contains a sf sound. In lines 11 and 12, there is alliteration of l sounds and sibilants which need more effort to enunciate clearly. I love thee with a love I seemed to lose with my lost saints and help to enhance the difficulty of those hard times in her past. She sums up her feelings of love for him in the final lines. I love thee with the breath, smiles, tears of all my life. Her love for him consumes all her life. It is as constant as her breathing, and is present in good times with her smiles and bad times with her tears. Her final thought, separated from the previous lines by a caesura, which allows a brief pause before the tone changes from one of passion to one of solemnity, takes her to the future as she rather hyperbolically declares, and if God choose, I shall but love thee better after death. Not even death can destroy her feelings for him, as she will continue to love him even more than she does now, if that's possible, for eternity in the afterlife. Thanks for watching. If you have any questions, please let me know in the comments section below and I'll do my best to answer them. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more videos on English language topics and exam techniques and English literature texts.